several authors that I enjoy reading. One is a man named A.W. Tozer. I like him so well that we named a dog after him. Uh, Tozer said this. Listen very carefully. He's talking to Christians and he says, it's become the de it, it becomes the devil's business to keep Christians imprisoned. He knows that the believing and justified Christian has been raised up out of the grave of sins and trespasses. From that point on, listen, Satan works that much harder to keep us bound and gagged, actually imprisoned in our own grave clothes. He knows that if we continue in this kind of bondage, we're not much better off than when we were spiritually dead. Now, when I read that quote, it's like a lot of stuff made sense to me. Look at me for a second. It's the, it's the idea that, okay, you get saved, you've been raised up out of, uh, to walk in a new life, you've been God's breathed spiritual life into your soul, but we still have the grave clothes on us. Some of us, we want to run for God, but we're still tangled up with certain things from our past, and uh, we, can't, we trip and we can't go anywhere. We want to reach out and, and love people, but our hands are still tied up and bound up, and... Uh, we can't reach out. We want to say something to our neighbors, our friends, people at school about God, but we still got, are gagged by the grave clothes that wrap around us. We want to see these spiritual, amazing spiritual things that, that God has for us, but we, we're blind because we still got grave clothes wrapped around us. So, the challenge after you get saved, okay, is to get rid of the grave clothes and to live the Jesus life. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand, but how do you know somebody that you were hanging out with them and they, they went to camp or, or uh, they came to some worship services, they were going through a thing in their life and they, it would seem that they genuinely met God, they genuinely were saved, but within a X amount of time, they're just right back to where they had been. Or you know somebody that they, they go through the thing on Sunday from 10.45 to 12 o'clock, but the rest of the week, they're really no different than somebody who's not saved. There's no real discernible difference. Or you have areas in your life where if you are really honest... There's not a whole lot of Jesus happening in that area of your life. Well, today we come to Ephesians chapter 4, and that's kind of the theme of what he's saying is to get rid of the grave clothes. As you recall, a few weeks ago we were in chapter 2, and Paul said, listen, you were dead. You were dead in the grave, in your trespasses and sins all wrapped up, in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. So he's saying, remember, you were all these things. We talked about this a few weeks ago. But now... You're alive in Christ. You got a whole new life. You're not a spiritual zombie any longer. You don't have to, to, to go through life half dead just looking for your next meal. You've been, God himself has breathed the life of the spirit of Jesus into you. And you've been raised spiritually from the dead and given a new life. Well, today we're in chapter 4, so if you want to turn in your Bible or check it out, chapter 4, verse 17 and 19, this is what he says, Paul, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles. In other words, don't live like the lost people. Don't live like the people that are still spiritual zombies. Stop it. 
For they're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they've closed their minds. They've hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But, verse 20, that isn't how you learned about Christ. That's not the Jesus life. Hello, duh, God's got something better for you. You don't have to live that way any longer. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, which is how to live that Jesus life, throw off the old sinful nature. Get rid of the grave clothes. Get unwrapped of all that garbage and your former way of life, which was corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on the new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now, I'm a big fan of the Jesus life. Because when I think about Jesus, this is how he lived. A life full of love, full of joy, full of peace, full of patience. Um, he lived a life of grace and truth. He lived a life of wisdom, of good decision-making, of passion for God, of compassion for people. A life of faith, not fear. Joy, not depression. Light, not darkness. Clarity, not confusion. Power, purity, and purpose. And Paul's been saying in this whole book, when you get saved, you can live that way too. You can live that way too. You don't have to live the zombie life any longer. That's done. Jesus died so you don't have to live a zombie life any longer. Live the new life. He's going to give four keys for living the new life. One, stop living the zombie life. As he said in verse 17, no longer live as the Gentiles. And then he's going to describe exactly what the zombie life looks like. Uh, the characteristics of it are these. Hopelessly confused. Hopelessly confused. Don't expect spiritual zombies to understand life. Dead, dead things don't understand life. They don't comprehend it. Don't expect zombies to make good decisions. Don't expect them to know the right direction that you need to go. Don't live the zombie life and don't let zombies tell you how to live your life. Second, dark minds. In the Bible, knowledge is usually pictured as light, and ignorance is pictured as, whiz, as uh, darkness. He says their, their minds are darkened. When it comes to spiritual things, they don't get it. It doesn't connect. They, they, they have no concept of what really is going to matter. What's going to last a thousand years from now? What's really important? Then he says they have hard hearts. Not only are they confused in their head, they're, they're hard in their heart. Truth bounces off them. Have you ever talked to somebody about spiritual things and it's like five minutes later, it's nothing? It just bounced off? There's just nothing. It, it, they're just hearts are hardened. Then they have a per perverted conscience. It says they have no sense of shame. When, when you're a spiritual zombie, you are finding things that God finds disgusting, you call acceptable. You call entertaining. You call honorable. You know, I got convicted when I was studying this, this week because sometimes I watch something on Netflix that is more zombie life than Jesus life. Our culture screwed up. Think about it. There's a guy who, who was a, a very famous athlete when I was coming along. And uh, he was a man, married to a woman, and then he married another woman, and then another woman. And then he decided one day that he was going to be a woman. And date men. And you know what? Okay. I mean, all right. If you're, if you're not saved, you don't know how to think about life. 
But what's sad is our culture celebrated this guy or person. They gave this poor person awards. It's like, what are, are no shame? They have perverted conscience. They have lustful pursuits and impure behavior. Lustful pursuits and impure behavior. All right, let me be straight up with you. Sex is only to be with a husband and his wife. Period. Sex outside of the covenant, which is marriage, is sin. Right? Duh. The person that understands humans, men, women, marriage, families, said, you know what? The only way this is going to work is within this boundary. You got to be married to each other, husband and wife. Not people who aren't married. Not people who are just casually participating in sex. Not, not a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, or a man and a woman and a man, or a woman and a man and another man, or and another woman. You know, it's interesting. 50 years ago, you would hardly have to have this discussion. But we've run so far from what God says is right that we just accept it. We are living in a culture with lustful pursuits and impure behavior. And you say, well, I'm not having sex, but you're addicted to porn. You're addicted to masturbation. Okay. That's sin. That's less than what God has for you. You know, when God lays something out, it's not to make your life harder or more miserable. It's to bring you to a place of greater blessing. You know, one thing I don't regret is that the first and only person I ever had sex with was my wife on our wedding night. You can feel the blessing of God in that. Look, don't live a zombie life. Don't let zombies tell you what is right and wrong and acceptable and good. Live the Jesus life. Uh, corrupted by lust and deception. Corrupted. You know, the picture of, there of that word is a corpse. You know, when, when you are not pursuing God, you're, you are, and life, you are pursuing death. Sin pushes you further from life and into death. Why, why let corpses tell you how to live your life? Why let a corpse tell you what's right and wrong? Why let a zombie tell you this is the way it's supposed to be? This is how you will have joy and fulfillment. Stop living the zombie life, Paul says. He's writing to people in the first century in Ephesus, which was a very, very corrupt city. He's saying, you can do it. Stop living the zombie life. Number two. He says, start living the Jesus life. That isn't how you learned about Christ. That's not the Jesus life. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life. Get out of the grave clothes. It's corrupted, the former way of life, by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God. The Jesus life, truly righteous and holy. Here he just mentions a few characteristics of the Jesus life. The first is that it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, we, we're all about Jesus because he, he's the guy that, that, that died for us and rose again. He's God's son. 
He's the Son of God. He is God the Son. He's incredible. But right now, technically, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so the most important person in your spiritual life is the Holy Spirit. And the only way you can live a Jesus life is through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you ha and, and this is the battle. Look at me. This is the battle you have even after you get saved. You want to sit on the throne. You want to sit in the driver's seat. You want to call the shots. I stand with hearts, arms high and heart surrendered. You know when it changed for me? When I said, I'm not driving anymore. I'm not that good a driver of life. I'm getting off the driver's seat. Holy Spirit, you sit in the driver's seat. And it's amazing. When the Holy Spirit is sitting in the driver's seat of your life, when you're allowing God the Holy Spirit to call the shots, you not only have the power to, to make the right decisions, you have the want to make the right decisions. You can live the Jesus life, and it's a good life because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The second thing about the Holy Spirit is this. Think about it. What's his primary job? It's to make you holy. <clears throat> when you get saved, you're not holy. You still have this corrupted nature, this polluted personality that God loves you anyway. God loves you unconditionally. Jesus died for you while you were still a sinner, knowing that you would be a sinner. But his job when he comes into your life is he starts cleaning stuff up because he's the Holy Spirit. He wants to make you holy. Now, in our culture, holy, holy doesn't sound like a good thing. Oh, holier than thou. She's holier than thou. She's always looking down her nose at me and telling me when I'm... That's not what it's about. Holiness means... You're so caught up in pursuing God that you don't even mess with sin. There's two sides of it. One is righteous, says you're righteous. That's the inner you. And then holy, the word there, talks about the outer you. Your behavior, your thoughts, your attitudes, your words. And so it's, holiness is, is who you are. Holiness is not about judging everybody. When you live the Jesus life, you love everybody. Holiness is about you pursuing God and God's things and not letting the zombie life, the zombie people, tell you what life is all about. You let God who created you and created life tell you what life is all about. And you're pursuing him. So, how do I live the Jesus life? Well, one, you stop living the zombie life. And two, you start living the Jesus life, and the, the, the third part of that is this. You start applying it. I'll go back one, would you? Apply Jesus' life to every area of your life every day. And so the end of this uh, chapter, that's exactly what he's doing. He's applying the Jesus life to every area of life every day. When I got saved... I stopped doing some things right away. I quit drinking right away. I quit pornography right away. Uh, I quit cussing, which was an accomplishment. That was a miracle work of God. But some things I, I still grave close. I struggle with anxiety and fear. I struggle with having a tongue that would cut people down, filled with sarcasm, make fun of people. I, I uh, struggle with uh, just still breaking out of the, the, the old grave clothes of depression, which is where I was when I met God. And it was, some of those things, it's still a struggle. Still a struggle. I still, I got rid of pornography, but I still struggle with lust. So, look at me. Some of you have gotten saved the last year or two, and you're like, why do I still struggle? Because you still got the old nature. 
Salvation is an event that is the result of a process. You, you make decisions about God. You, you take steps of faith to God. Yes, I believe there is a God. I believe he's real. I believe I've sinned. I believe I need God. And, and you take steps. It's a, it's a process leading to an event. But from that event of salvation, when you were born again, then it's a process of living it out, which is what the whole second half of Ephesians is about. And Paul gives... Six areas where we need to live it out. The first A is stop lying and start telling the truth. Now he could have listed any six. These were six that the Ephesians especially struggle with. And these might be ones that you struggle with. Stop lying and start truth telling. Uh, verse 25. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we're all parts of the same body. Stop lying. You, you say, well I don't lie. Well let me ask you this. Do you tell the whole truth? Sometimes it's just by leaving parts out, it's, you're being deceptive. Sometimes when you exaggerate, you're being deceptive. You're making things look better or worse than they really are. Are you a truth teller? Now, what I found about lying, the easy, every time I lie, I just step into the darkness. And then it becomes easier to tell the next one and the next one, and then you get all caught up in a mess. You ever done that? It's so much easier. Just, just set your mind on this. What is the truth? Tell the truth. The Jesus life, listen, is all about the truth. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anytime you are deceptive, you are not being a Jesus person. Because Jesus is all about the truth. Now, you don't use the truth to just tell everybody, you know, we tell you everything I think about you. Um, we'll talk about that. But overall, you need to stop lying and start telling the truth. I challenge you this week. Make, just, this, here's your challenge. Can you make sure everything that comes out of your mouth is true? Some of you have somehow gotten your mind that lying to your parents is acceptable. To avoid conflict, to not hurt them, whatever. Second part of this, stop the anger, start the reconciliation. Don't let, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. So, stop the anger, the unrighteous anger, start the reconciliation Get this right before, don't let it last forever. For anger gives the foothold to a devil. You know what happens when you get angry? You basically give your brain and your tongue to the devil and say, have fun. And so you think all sorts of bad things and you say all sorts of bad things. You know, things you would never say. Hurtful things. And the bad thing about what comes out of your mouth when you're angry is you can't take it back. It's like toothpaste. Once you squeeze it out, it's out there. You can't put toothpaste back in. When you say something out of anger, it's out there. You've hurt somebody. Stop the anger. Uh, start the reconciliation. When people get mad, they do one of two things. They either clam up, which is what I tend to do. What's wrong? Nothing. Or they blow up. What's wrong? Let me tell you what's wrong. And just rip somebody. Well, neither one is effective because the goal is reconciliation. Okay, we got a problem here. I'm angry about this. How do I deal with this? How do I bring resolution here? Um, stop the anger. Work on making it right. Now... When, when I do marriage counseling or pre-marriage counseling, uh, we would talk about in this passage, actually, we call this passage fair fighting. You know, don't be honest, tell the truth. Second, resolve anger issues. And one thing we would say here is avoid gunpowder words, the words that you say when you're angry that hurt people. Let me give you a few examples. Um, exaggerations. You are the most... 
on the whole planet, there's what, seven billion people? And how many have there been through history? You're, you, you are the least. Or how about this one? Absolutes. You never pick up your socks. Well, yeah, no, wait, wait. Back in 1943, I actually did. You always, whenever you are, are making absolutes, whenever you are exaggerating, you're not resolving conflict, you're making the other person defensive. About derogatory names. You are a spoiled brat. You are such a prima donna. You are such a princess. You are such a drama queen. You are a jerk. You're a wimp. I think you got the idea there. Comparisons. Oh, this, uh, don't you hate it when somebody does this? Why don't you, why can't you be like so-and-so? Can't you be like her husband? How about this one? Indirect attacks. I, I do this sometimes. Well, you know, most people would say. How about this one? Defensive attacks. Okay. Here's the situation. I'm 90% of the problem, and a person's pointing it out to me. But I, to defend myself, I'm like, yeah, but what about you? What about this? What about that? And I bring up 87 things. What about when you said that? What about what you did? Uh, empty threats. If you do that again, <laughs> you got to do the I thing when you do that. Did you? If you do that again. Okay, what do you do instead of that stuff? This is what you do. Let's say Kathy and I are angry, or one of us is angry. First thing you do is acknowledge a problem. Obviously, you're upset. <laughs> or, I'm upset. Okay, I'm upset. Then you attack the problem, not the person. Now, I, you, this is, especially when you got kids, it seems like we had this conversation every day. Look, I love you, committed to you, but this is what you do. Instead of, but you're a jerk, you're doing this, you, do, you say, look, we seem to have a situation here. And you take the situation and you put it on the table and you get together and resolve the situation. We seem to have a situation here. Your clothes seem to not end up in the hamper. <laughs> now what can we do to resolve this? Do you need a bigger hamper? Is it just too small you miss when you shoot? Or... <laughs> you, you acknowledge there's a problem, you attack the problem, not the person, and you admit your share of the problem. Now look, I know I got upset because you keep doing this. Or... <laughs> This has happened, actually it would be better to say, this has happened more than once. And then if you're, you take ownership for your part of the problem. Look, would you forgive me? I've had a stinking attitude. Every time I walk in your room, I forget about how much I love you and I get ticked off by all the clothes I see lying here. Forgive me, I've had a bad attitude. Now, of course, the other person should at that point go, well, forgive me, I, I need to do better at picking up my clothes. Nod your heads, you with me? Yep. So, resolve the conflict. Third thing, stop stealing. Now, sometimes we steal because we are not giving a full day's work. Or we're not being, you know, Kathy and I are both adjunct professors. And, and a Christian university. And it's amazing to me how Christian students, most of my students are, are going to be pastors. How they think that using somebody else's material or whatever and not giving them credit and plagiarism is somehow a good thing. It's not. It's stealing. Uh, stop stealing. Instead, work, do your own work. And this is the key to this one. Give. Give. Stop being a taker, start being a giver. You see, the key to all these, you say, I got all these bad things still in my life. Don't obsess about all the bad in it as much as focus on the opposite side of it, the good side of it. Um, stop stealing, start honest work. 
The fourth one is this. Stop the potty mouth. Start positive talk. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. That's pretty clear. Now, what, what comes under that is not just cussing, but when you are sexual in innuendos, don't you hate it when some, that you get this person that just turned everything into a sexual thing? Uh, what about sarcasm and cut downs? Those are the ones that got me. That's a form of abusive words. Now, my dad used to have this sign, and he used to say this. My mom would say it. I didn't like it, but it actually was good. How many of you, your parents have ever been like that, right? You didn't like it, but it, you realize you get a little older, it was good. This is what it said. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? True, kind, necessary, helpful. Look at me. I used to always say, yeah, but it's true. <laughs> But uh, is it helpful? Look, I, I realize that in my thoughts and a lot of my speech, it's become too critical. And so I'm making a commitment this week to speak more positively about situations and people that I tend to speak too critically about. Okay, the fifth one. Stop being bitter. I'm sorry. Stop hurting God. Start living your identity in Christ. And I'm going to come back to that. And the last one, stop being bitter, start forgiving. Look at this little progression here. Get rid of all bitterness, and then when bitterness is undealt with, it becomes rage, and then it becomes anger, and then it becomes harsh words, and then it becomes slander, where you are, you know, nobody can say anything good about somebody. You know you need to deal with bitterness in your heart. Look at me. When... So a name is mentioned and somebody says something even good about them and you go, yeah, but that's evil speaking. And then uh, slander and then all types of evil behavior where you want to hurt them. There's a passage of scripture in Romans that says, let God take vengeance and do good to people, and basically you heap coals of fire on their head. Now, there's something in my personality. I, I don't get bitter so much when you hurt me, but if you hurt somebody I love, then I get really mad at you. But that still can be wicked. And I've got to let go of that. And I, 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 I must tell you, I'm a schemer. I think of ways that I could hurt the person without anybody knowing <laughs> That's when I know that I really need to repent here on this point. Get rid of the, the bitterness and on the other side, start forgiving. To start forgiving. Jesus said, listen to these words please. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. I had a couple in for marriage counseling years ago. And he's going on about his wife, and he, he says, you know what, she's not even like a wife. I'm saying, look, dude, let's just get this clear. The Bible says you've got to love your wife. He said, she's not even acting like a wife. I said, well, then, it says love your neighbor. He said, well, she's worse than any of my neighbors. I said, well, then it says love your enemy. Where are you going to go with that, right? Now notice how you get out of bitterness. Okay, one, you let go. Of, you list the people that have hurt you and you say, God, I choose to forgive them. The other side of it is this. It says, instead be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you. Look at me. When you get to where you can do this that Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you, you're on the right side of this verse. You say, no, 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 you don't know what they've done to me, I cannot forgive them. Don't give them your forgiveness. It says you're supposed to forgive them as Christ has forgiven you. He's given you unconditional forgiveness. Think how many times you've hurt him. You take that forgiveness he has given you, and that's what you give them. 
as you give them the forgiveness you've received. You can forgive anybody, anything. Because he has forgiven anybody, anything. Even the people that were crucifying, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, last point, number four, it says, don't forget, you can't live the Jesus life without Jesus. So if you're here and you've not been saved, you don't have Jesus in your life, this would be a very frustrating talk to you, for you because you can't fully walk this out. If you're, you've been born again, but you've just stopped there in your spiritual journey, this would still be a frustrating talk for you because you're not tapping into the power to live it out. But you can. You can live this life. Last thing I wanted to say was number five, it said stop hurting God, the, the, the previously. Here's the motivation. And when I was praying about this message this morning, this is where I ended up. Would you please just listen to me one more minute. We just celebrated the Lord's table. Big, the big key to living this all out is when you reach the point where you're, you, in your mind, your heart, you say, I don't want to do that anymore because it hurts Jesus. Jesus died for that. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit that's in me, has to put up with this. I want to love God more than I love my sin. I want to love God more than I love myself. He says, stop hurting God. Live out your identity. Be who you are. You can live the Jesus life. Now for the next minute, I want you to be honest. I've been doing this for almost 35 years, talking to groups of people. And I know for a fact, when I was talking about some things today, the Holy Spirit was pointing his finger right on your heart, saying, come on. It's time to let go of that. Get unwrapped there. Put that down. Put it off. Pick up the Jesus life in that area. Some of you actually, you need to get out of your seat. You need to kneel. You need to bring that thing that's not what it should be and give it to God. And pick up what God has for you. Would you bow your heads? Father, I just ask in the name of Jesus that even now in our response, we, we would just please you because you deserve it. You're worth it. We would honor you. Our response to truth would be pleasing to you. God, some of these areas, they're so convicting. Our culture.